recorded and uh, we'll update it we'll upload it later on for everybody to uh, uh, to watch now just a couple of words about uh, you so um, Mr. Hurry uh, executes Trish's vision. Uh, first of all, you are the Chief Innovation Officer and Deputy Director at the Trans uh, Translational Research Institute for Space Health. Uh, it's a mouthful. <laughs> yep. So Trish, and your vision is finding and funding impactful emerging health and human performance technologies to aid NASA's deep space exploration, which includes uh, Artemis and Mars mission. Uh, this uh, entails coordinating all solicitation, funding mechanisms, uh, outreach efforts, new partnerships, and uh, procurement strategies. In addition, uh, you lead the Institute's industry program, which funds companies ranging in scale from startup to large multinational to develop or validate health and human performance technologies that can support astronauts on a future mission to Mars and back. Working with external stakeholders, Mr. O'Hurry coordinates uh, uh, the contractual aspects of the commercial space flight program. Prior to joining uh, Trish, Mr. Hurry established and led innovation partnerships in the Texas Children's System. Uh, and you received your MBA from Jones School of Business of Rice University, where you later taught health ventures and healthcare finance. So um, yeah, so uh, so I'm very happy that you're here with us today. And we met several times in, in Houston um, and you'll be building a, a, a great panel at our uh, Houston conference that's coming up on February 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, maybe, you know, a couple of words about yourself. I know that you yourself come from a third generation. If I'm not mistaken, maybe I'm mistaken regarding the generation, but from a family mm -hmm. A business so we'd love to hear a little bit more about uh you sure um so i have a little bit of an unusual background um i uh, am, am first of all not a scientist so you know i i am in a science institute so um i have a chief medical officer reporting to me and a and a chief science officer and a, and a whole staff of subject matter experts um and so um i, I what i do is kind of more of a coo function basically i uh, manage all of the timelines and all the solicitations and make sure that we hit all of our targets and that and and then we adapt as needed to an ever-changing world um, from my background uh, yes I, I I came from a family where um, a relative uh, built a company up to um, to uh, 20 states in the United States and then ended up selling that company that was actually in um, in tree care um, so in in uh, municipalities and in, in things like um, tree lines and, and how to make sure the electric companies, uh, you know, actually don't have things actually hit their their properties and, and assets. Um, and then actually several parts of my family are different uh, entrepreneurs. So we've got uh, one relative that is uh, runs a venture capital firm for real estate, one relative that is uh, an executive in the Boy Scouts of America, um, another executive that is uh, putting together uh, or another company that puts together um, uh, furnishings for hotels. Um, and so that's been the environment I grew up in. Uh, before joining Trish, I uh, I helped a, a large radiology practice um, and and, a, and was president of a billing company um, after business school, and then jumped into Texas Children's, which um, which was a fascinating job actually. I did that for almost a decade, and and that's where um, I was originally hired on as a, a kind of a special forces finance team that was focused on new growth for a very the largest children's hospital in the world. Um, and in the process, I have identified that we didn't have an innovation department. We didn't have an intellectual property policy. Um, and so I um, dug in and built um, uh, the capabilities of a group called the uh, Innovation Partnerships. Um, and so we, in essence, um, managed not just the intellectual property that would come from our campus and our physicians and and, uh, and, and our operations, uh, but also the um, in uh, the outside in, which is the procurement of, of new emerging technologies that can help our IT department and help our clinicians provide better care. Um, and what I found really quickly was that actually it's really hard to generate IP out of a system, even though a lot of systems do across the country. Um, and what is actually much more impactful is to bring in amazing technologies that are being seen by 
groups like on this call, but also through a wide variety of, uh, of other accelerators, incubators, investors. Um, and so it's better to just go out and get the best instead of to try to make the best from a limited uh, pool of intellectual property. Um, and, and in doing so, I actually aligned a number of pediatric hospitals. So I had Boston Children's, Stanford Children's, Texas Children's, uh, Atlanta Children's, Cincinnati Children's. We all formed a large network that uh, would allow us to actually not duplicate efforts so we wouldn't waste capital or resources or people. Um, we would actually cheer each other's successes and make sure those successes got through product validation, got into the market, got used by our physicians and helped kids. Um, and in the process, somehow, um, I got the attention of, of the folks here at Trish um, and, and the, the general argument was, um, I, you know, I created uh, new um, new companies, new new tools uh, for small markets for kids, um, and and apparently astronauts are just as cranky and small. So, uh, so in that environment, uh, in the in the pediatric environment, I could offer to buy something like a hundred units, uh, and that might help a, a technology get through validation and, and come to market. Now, um, as a kind of a representative of uh, basically the U.S. space program, I can offer to buy like one piece of technology, maybe eight years from now. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a similar argument, which is, um, you know, uh, we can we can help you come to market um, and, and we'll be somewhat unique in your marketing um, and we'll give you non-dilutive capital. Um, but it's, you know, it's still small markets. Um, there's still not a whole lot of astronauts. Uh, but the commercial spy, f- side is actually possibly changing that. And I'll go into that in a little bit here. Um, but I, you know, came from an entrepreneurial background, you know, I've taught entrepreneurship, really believe that uh, that that is the driver for you know the, the increase of of human um, um, quality of life um, and and try to use uh, those currents as, in a way to help humanity and to and to grow and build um, and and so I can explain that when I you know show what it is we do at Trish um, but that's you know my background in a nutshell. Great, so we'll, we'll get um, to that because we do want to learn more. How you act, how you invest, how long has Trish been around, how you work with NASA, for instance, uh, and all of that. Um, so, uh, so uh, basically, uh, uh, you fund different projects. What would you say would be the craziest one you've dealt with? Organizations that that actually provide federal funding involve um, a deployment of capital in order to advance a mission, and in this instance, that mission is uh, NASA. And so, some of the more interesting things involve uh, what um, you know. One project where we actually have a, a small, in essence, machine that gets. Uh, ingested and actually gets set up in an intestine. And that intestine then actually, it, it actually grapples to an essence to set of the large intestine. Um, and then it uses your normal flow of nutrients that go through your digestive system, whatever makes it past, uh, past the stomach and actually the, um, manufactures very simple uh, molecules such as vitamins possibly. Uh, the, the long-term potential could be that it actually could manufacture some kind of uh, therapeutic. If somebody needed to take something forever and ever for the rest of their lives, then this particular thing might be able to actually produce that at some kind of regular increment um, and, and kind of stabilize the metabolism for an extended period of time. It's wacky because it goes on the other side of the stomach, uh, but still does set up shop in a, in a kind of a protective environment and, and then would produce uh, something in, in positive aspect for uh, months and years, if possible. The reason we're interested in something like that is for radiation protectants. So the the ability for the body to be able to protect itself against large dose radiation or what are called galactic cosmic rays. Um, and that will actually help um, stabilize not just the injury, but possibly the repair as well. Um, so we're exploring things like that. There's another thing that actually involves uh, lettuce. Uh, we, we've actually paid a researcher to uh, to take lettuce and to actually produce small molecules such as vitamins or therapeutics from the lettuce itself. And, and the idea being in a very small economy in a very small enclosed space, uh, 
um, you will need, you won't be able to take a pharmacy along with us to Mars. Um, and so you'll need everything working in concert and producing. Uh, and the trade-off is you, you can't necessarily eat the lettuce you can, but you have to grow it in increments so that you're not only taking it in for caloric intake, but also for something like um, melatonin or something that might be a, a, a small molecule that could potentially help uh, the, the, the homeostasis of the body over long periods of time. So a couple of things, um, and, I'll, and I'll go into some of that here shortly, but let me go ahead and just start by giving a kind of background of, uh, of what we do at Trish. And then from there, I uh, would love to be able to answer questions. Um, but I, will, I would just like to mention because uh, mm -hmm. I broke off. So as you can see, I moved to a different part of the of the office here, uh, in a different mm -hmm. camera. So I ask you which projects, which uh, uh, crazy projects you guys have been involved with, and you mentioned mm -hmm. radiation. So what's going on today? Today, when they fly to space, they 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 get radiation, and that, uh, how does yeah. that affect them? So there are actually. Um, Right now, there's there's a couple of different layers of access into space. So right now, um, if something goes to the International Space Station or is in low Earth orbit, which is where a lot of the commercial flights are happening, those are well within the Van Allen belts. And so those have a, a fair amount of protection from the really injury prone radiation, which is called galactic cosmic rays. Once you get past to the Van Allen belt and you get into something like a lunar mission or into a Mars mission, um, the crew will start to receive uh, a lot more intense radiation from uh, background sources in, uh, in the cosmos as they come about. That galactic cosmic rays are high energy, heavy metal ions moving at incredible speeds. Um, so uh, what that means is we don't yet have a shielding um, that can protect uh, the crew. So in essence, these ions move at incredible speeds. They go right through the vehicle, right through the human uh, and create double stranded and single stranded DNA breaks at random parts of the body. Um, and it, it's interesting because you can't actually just do something like a lead lining, because once you do something really heavy like that, the high energy ions hit uh, a, a very dense piece of metal and then cause a ca cascade. And the end result is actually more damage, not less. So what NASA and others have looked at is actually uh, re-engineering the vehicle so that an amount of water would be going around certain parts of a long-term vehicle, a Mars in essence vehicle, um, and the either waste or water uh, storage would actually provide better protection against heavy metal ions than, um, than you know, just a, a heavy piece of uh, something that might be even really expensive to take up. Um, so it, it's actually causing us to be very, very creative. The reason I mentioned the difference is that, you know, right now paying crews, uh, the commercial crews that are going to SpaceX and, and the International Space Station, Axiom Space, some of the things I'll get into in this talk, um, they stay within the Van Allen belts. And so they receive a relatively low dose of radiation over a short period of time um, and, and likely will have absolutely no effects because of it. And we've proven that because of a continuous Houston human presence of uh, a NASA astronaut on the International Space Station since 2001. So for 20 straight years, we have had astronauts up in low Earth orbit and have been able to monitor their health. And so we're very, very clear that we do that well. Well, we actually can make sure that humans thrive in um, in the International Space Station and in the productive uh, fields of the Van Allen belts. Um, and and you know that has got a ton of data to support that. Uh, where we start to get out into the unknown is not just the lunar missions where we have some experience, but not as much experience as low Earth orbit, but the Mars missions is where you start to get into 900 day missions where the astronaut crew will be affected by uh, a significant amount of radiation. So, um, and so what so we're trying to do moon, is protect that. So going to the moon and back is still good. Yep. Not, not too bad of a problem. Yeah. Moon and back is you, you'll get some radiation, but it's only seven to 10 days. Not crazy. Um, but at the same time, even when we put the new space station in orbit around the moon, which will be what's called the deep space gateway, uh, that still will be unmanned for something like 11 months of the year. We simply can't have a human up there for an extended period of time because that human will, uh, anything past something like two to four weeks, will start to experience a lot of radiation. Uh, and so what they're looking at is actually a moon base on the south pole of the moon, um, that would be underground in essence, uh, underground to the moon would just be a uh, subterranean environment. And that would help protect the astronauts or the paying passengers or crew that look to go to the moon, uh, which is something we'll look at here shortly. Um, and so just for context here, um, 
again, explaining that Trish is, um, is, is a vehicle for deploying federal capital, uh, meaning that it's, this is taxpayer dollars. Uh, we actually align with NASA's normal operations. Um, so we align, um, and, and I'm assuming you can see my slides. Um, and, and so NASA has its normal procurement process. Um, and this normal procurement process uh, actually um, you know, looks into things that are more immediate. So things like the current Artemis mission, which is coming up, the lunar missions in order to put the first female boots on the moon uh, here by 2024, uh, announced by the Trump administration and, and supported also by the Biden administration and with uh, support from both parties. Um, and so what Trish's part is actually tasked to do is to go out past NASA. So, um, so not just what's what's immediate need, but what may be future needs and, and leaps forward. Um, so that's why we show you know the moon footprint and the and the Mars footprint. We really want to support humanity thriving in space and getting to Mars. Um, and so, uh, this is just an example of the difference of philosophy. Um, we are in essence an innovation institute, so we are charged with supporting, finding, and and funding. Uh, amazing, uh, new amazing technologies. That's going to be in a variety of different backgrounds, from science to physicians to companies to engineers. Uh, we are uh, constantly adapting to emerging landscapes like synthetic biology uh, in order to uh, refocus and put out a solicitation into an area that has merit. An example would be four years ago, we were doing artificial intelligence. Now artificial intelligence is everywhere. Um, so what we're doing now in synthetic biology is going to be leading the, the charge into what will be you know, the, the growth in these markets for the next two to three to five years. Um, so this is a, a, probably a better way to explain some of the differences here for, uh, with your recent question, Denny. So uh, right now, a lot of activity is happening in this uh, yellow circle here, this uh, orbital and ISS. So this is commercial space flight support. Uh, you'll see this on dramatic ways with SpaceX and with Space Adventures, which is launching here in December, and Axiom Space, which is launching in February. These missions usually have what's called a DRM or a design reference mission that would involve either a three-day trip to space, which we saw with the Inspiration4 flight that we just supported, um, or possibly up to something like a 10-day mission at the International Space Station. And you'll see that with these next two flights coming up. So between these uh, environments, you're going to see normal paying people, normal everyday people such as ourselves um, that, that you know had the means and able to buy something like a 40 or $50 million ticket uh, and go experience space for some period of time. Um, and during that time, they'll also be doing some amount of experimentation with us uh, and health monitoring. So the difference here is that on a three to 10 day mission, you're really not getting a huge amount of, uh, of, of impact. Um, and if anything goes really wrong, you can turn around and come back to earth within three hours. Um, and that's helpful. You know? So if, if anything um, starts to, to go off the rails, um, you can have medical care within, you know, three to five hours, which is, uh, which covers most needs, uh, as you can imagine. Um, this, uh, this actually also includes those little three to nine minute uh, flights, which you can see Bezos and, and Branson doing. Um, those are actually going to be obviously a lot more cost affordable. So you're going to be able to see those for, I think we expect them to be, you know, less than a million. I think those tickets are going to go uh, I don't know, anywhere between three to 800,000, I, I assume. Um, and, uh, and for that, you get a, you know, a, a short trip that basically amounts to looking down on the earth for something like three to, to eight minutes. Uh, and we're working with Blue Origin on their, um, on, on their health monitoring and, and impact. But in that three minutes or so, you know, the human body doesn't actually have enough time to uh, adapt. So it, it's pretty much normal. So the next stop is the lunar vicinity. And this is where you get a little further out. This is where you start to get really that, that radiation uh, impact. Um, and on the lunar vicinity, uh, those are something like 10 to 20 day missions. And in that environment, you will be receiving radiation. In that environment, um, it's, it's harder to come back. In that environment, you're looking at something like a two to three day return time in order to make sure that you land in the right place and that you don't um, uh, reenter in, in, a, in an area that you know, isn't ideal. Um, and so... Um, if anything medical happens on a 10 to 20 day mission, then you, know, you have an entirely different kind of argument um, and it's a different level of medical care. Uh, so in that environment, we're gonna have to be self-sufficient in a number of ways, similar to if you uh, needed to provide medical care in a remote environment on earth and you may need some kind of data support or subject matter expert support, uh, 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 medical director, uh, something like that, that, that can actually help and when you don't have a physician right next to you. 
Um, and so the lunar vicinity is where you're going to see a lot of the focus of NASA for the next uh, decade, in essence. There's a whole series of flights on the Artemis schedule, uh, and they will, in essence, uh, establish a, a base around the lunar activity in orbit. Um, and then it'll also look in placing uh, another base down on the surface. And that will not only facilitate activities uh, for NASA to explore the moon, um, and, which you know we have done from afar for a while, but would actually be in, per in person, but also encourage um, some of the commercial activities. So you know, there's already the first gentleman, uh, a Japanese uh, billionaire that has bought the first ticket to the moon. And, and he actually, he has bought all of the tickets for his flight. Uh, and he has pledged to take a number of uh, uh, artists with him uh, in order to really tell humanity about what it's like to see the earth from the moon. Um, and so NASA is taking into account the space economy, the, the need uh, for some kind of commercial activity. Um, and so that is actually incorporated into the design. But most of this design for this deep space gateway is what's called Mars Forward, which is focusing on what the 900 day mission to Mars will need as a launching off point from in essence, the moon. 900 day mission to Mars means that you've got something like a two and a half year trip, which means you're gonna have something like eight months there, something about of a year of habitation on Mars and about eight months back. And the reason for that is the orbits of the two planets. So during a period of time there, during that one year of habitation, Mars will actually be as far away as the other side of the sun. And there will be up to something like 20 minute data lags uh, between the earth and Mars. Uh, and, and possibly even a blackout period of time of something like two weeks where there won't be any communication that's possible as the sun is in between uh, the Earth and Mars. During this period of time, there is no return. So if something goes wrong, there is no three hours back to Earth or three days back to Earth. Uh, on, a, on a Mars trip, whatever happens, happens, and the crew has to figure it out until they are able to return back. Uh, and so in that environment, that's where we need the smartest tools, the, uh, the smartest platforms uh, uh, and interconnectivity that doesn't exist today to provide perfect healthcare with minimal mass power and volume uh, very far from home. Um, and so that's our, our real challenge, which is how do we create perfect healthcare that you can fit in your pocket that can benefit the earth? So anything that actually can help with uh, healthcare in a, in a wide variety of distant environments, um, but will be unique for basically four astronauts in a very confined space with a very limited amount of support, meaning no pharmacy uh, will have to manufacture on demand. There will likely be some amount of manufacturing of food on demand. You'll have to keep track of the, of the carbon economy and the oxygen economy. So every single molecule will matter. Um, and so the challenges there will really push humanity to try to solve some problems that we believe will help uh, humanity on earth. And I want to ask you just before you go on, two questions. Uh, when do you think we'll actually see a flight to Mars? And mm -hmm. why is this fixation we have as human beings about Mars since uh, A.G. <laughs> Walls uh, started with it and uh, women from Mars and men from Venus and all of that or the other way around? Why Mars? Yeah, so, um, so great question. And, um, and, you know, I think we're always looking for Martians. Um, I think the, um, the appeal of Mars, first of all, the, the scheduled launch is expected to be 2033. Um, so right now, the, the expected very first uh, uh, launch by NASA it has a defined period. It is uh, 2033, uh, and they are actually already looking at the astronaut core for who they're going to recruit. Uh, that will be, you know, the best of the best um, in the astronaut core that will go for this, you know, human defining mission. Um, and, uh, and the appeal for Mars is, is, is A, just a fascination because it's not Earth. Um, you know, B, because it, it possibly has some real tantalizing aspects such as water and, and, and the beginnings of an ionosphere. And so uh, if you're looking for the next place where humanity could potentially reside, as seen in shows like The Expanse and, and novels, then that is a real possibility. Um, uh, obviously, very, very difficult. So there's a lot of changes. There's a big difference in the atmosphere, obviously, between uh, Mars and Earth. But uh, with certain things um, currently active, you know, they are looking at how they can change some of that. Uh, but what is also appealing about Mars is this asteroid belt that's near it. Um, and you, you already know about the abundance of the Earth, the amount of minerals that are available, um, and, and it is absolutely endless in the, in the asteroid belt. So if you're looking for a, a reason um, uh, to, to justify the expense and, 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 and show a very large potential 
um, uh, increase of, of human quality of life, uh, it would be from uh, an enormous amount of resources that are right on the outside of, of Mars, and Mars would be the waypoint for harvesting those resources and getting them back into use. Um, and so that's somewhat of the appeal. If you're just looking at the moon, there's not much there. And so uh, there's, there's you know, a reason for us to go because we'll learn and because we're an exploration species. But Mars is where you'll start to see a real economy and you'll start to see uh, several of the drivers of, of why humans take risk. So what, what you think is that NASA is going to try hard to uh, have the astronauts compete amongst each other to be the best of the best. So uh, they'll tell them, guys, you're going on a two and a half year trip where in between there are two weeks where you could be, well, anything can happen to you. We wouldn't know about it, but good luck, right? That's the yeah. marketing yeah. spiel here. Okay. Yeah. So, well, and also to be I the first ever. Some of the astronauts will not try hard to compete to be the best. No, that, it's the exact opposite. They all want to be the next John Glenn. They all want to be the next human that steps foot on where no other human has been. Um, and, and to great personal risk, by the way, we've talked about radiation, which means they'll likely have a shortened lifespan. They know that they're going to take uh, uh, a, a fair amount of damage in the process. Uh, but they also know they'll represent the best of humanity. And so there's, there's a long line. And, and you got to understand that even getting into the astronaut core is incredibly competitive. So there's, they receive thousands of applicants. They end up taking a very, very small number, something like five to 10 in a particular year. Um, and then from there, in that astronaut core of something like 30 people, um, there will be a lot of competition uh, in order to get the commanders and the absolute folks that have done the most and the best uh, in order to represent humanity on on this historic flight, so uh, exact opposite. They're 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 all ready and they all want to go right now. If we could go, got it. So when um, I'm thinking twice whether I should travel from from New York to Tel Aviv, <laughs> you're saying that's 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 nothing. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Well, and, and actually one of the things, and I'll, and I'll go into it when I get into the commercial space flight, is uh, transportation, which means you're starting to see you know things like the. Uh, uh, the Concorde come back. You're starting to see what, uh, how they, you know, they how they they harvest some of this low Earth orbit flight in order to move people around the Earth really quickly. So you could actually have a flight from Tel Aviv to New York in a fraction of the time you currently do if that plane is willing to go into uh, or out of the atmosphere and then come back in at at, at high speeds. Um, so I think they've even I think SpaceX has even offered to move. Uh, troops around the planet within two hours or something like that. So there, there are also tangible benefits besides things like communication satellites where transportation in and of itself may change by, uh, by speeding up quite a bit because of advances in things like propulsion. Um, so, you know, all, all new things. All these flights to space. I mean, it's, what do you see it in 10 years? Do, do you think we'll have, what would be the price to go? How, how, you know, many people you think you will be seeing going there and and the value actually is the experience right to go and see earth in not only at disney but to see it actually <laughs> right yeah so um so we're, we're going to see a large increase and, and here i actually have a slide on it here in a, in a little bit i think the costs will come down um and, and and i'll explain that here also um let me let me round back to that question real quickly but let me get a little bit further sure um so uh, again, we you know we are an innovation institute, and so the the focus is on how do we source uh, change in essence, uh, technology change, knowledge change, um, and so we have a, a couple of ends of the spectrum here. So on on the left side we have a proof of concept. So this is real early, out of, out of the box stuff. You know this is the last solicitation we did in this area was around suspended animation or torpor. Um, and suspended animation is something that you, you have seen in every sci-fi movie and TV show that you've ever seen. It's an expectation that we're going to put people to sleep and they're not going to age and they're going to wake up perfectly fine and, uh, and, and a number of years will have gone by. Uh, we actually don't need this for the Mars mission, but this is the type of thing you would do to go to uh, outside of, of, uh, of our neighborhood, you know, well past Pluto and into uh, you know, the next possible uh, solar system. Um, but we're doing that in order to see what the benefits could be in humanity with regards to not just maybe short duration travel, but possibly things like emergency medicine. So you, you already see some amount of cooling, uh, cooling around C-spine injuries uh, for brain or, or neck, uh, and that's a, a meant to, to decrease things like inflammation uh, and swelling. Uh, and so what we're looking to do is to 
is to take those concepts and try to see, can we put somebody in a suspended animation state or at least a lowered state for some amount of time? And the goal would be for uh, less food consumption, less oxygen consumption, less waste production. How can we just have less of a human impact on, on our very close environment um, so that we don't have to um, pack as much to go? And, and some of it's economic and some of it is need. Um, but one of the benefits to these projects is that it looks like it may possibly help um, uh, organ transplantation technologies. So right now you have a fixed window of something like X number of hours before a heart will go bad. Uh, and what we've looked at doing is actually super cooling tissue but still having it viable. So it would be in essence, as, uh, as it says, suspended animation, it'd be, it would be uh, in a state that would allow it to be recovered, but, uh, but not in a way that would actually be crystallized and therefore destroyed. And it possibly could extend the transportation or uh, uh, transplantation process um, from hours to days. Um, and so th that's the type of impact that we hope to find on, on these kind of far ranging disruptive aspects. We're looking next at longevity as far as disruptive. You know, how do you define the hallmarks of aging? There's a, a fair amount of research in that area. Um, and how can we possibly impact some of the aspects of aging? Um, because spaceflight actually shows advanced aging, uh, which means that uh, when um, uh, on the recent twin study, uh, we had an astronaut that was on station for a year. And when he came back to earth, he had the immune system of an 80 year old man. Wow. Um, and within two months, his immune system actually corrected back to his normal age. Um, and, uh, and that was a real interesting moment because it showed that, uh, humans immune systems, um, can, uh, can, can potentially age very fast, or at least show the markers of aging very fast and can correct very fast. Um, and so we're going to be digging into how the lessons of space can potentially help us all live longer and better here on earth, uh, for those that are interested beyond things like blue zones. Um, and so that's the disruptive side, and, and I'll explain a little bit about our solicitations coming up, um, but this really is more business development in science circles. This is really early stuff, pre-company, pre-IP, uh, pre-investment. Um, so what we do is, is help a little in the valley of death to try to say, will this work? Can the U.S. government use it? Um, and, and we are actually encouraged to take a large amount of risk here. NASA uh, doesn't take risks. And so it pays us to take risks outside of its walls. Um, and so we, we swing for things that are very difficult, uh, like brain computer interfaces, um, and try to bring them closer to market if possible. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we have more market ready technologies. So, um, uh, one, one, um, unfortunate thing is that, you know, the, the technology on the international space station is, uh, is, is not exactly new. Um, so it has been up there for a number of years and it's not what's coming down the pipe. And so there are, there isn't like a computing stack on the International Space Station. A lot of their computing is done off tablets. Um, and so there's a fair amount of improvement that can just be ahead of what's coming to market now that doesn't have to be 10 years in the future. Um, so what we do is find, you know, a new ultrasound like the Butterfly IQ system, where we try to find uh, uh, one of the things we're looking at is a, is a very, very um, miniaturized MRI so that you can actually uh, do MRI in space. And the benefit of that is that the field is so small that you can actually wear metal around it, uh, which is unlike your, your normal MRIs. Um, and then we also look at um, a number of things like food um, and how, how can this explosion of proteins and carbohydrates and fats and manufacturing, how can that be incorporated into, this, uh, into some of these experiments? Um, and we've, we've got something uh, coming out right now that is um, backed by the Alexa Fund. It's called Agenta. It's a company that is a conversational agent. They used to be called chatbots. Now they're much more sophisticated. Um, but one of the hallmarks of this technology is that it actually monitors your mental health as you use it. And we are constantly looking for ways that are non-obtrusive monitoring, uh, things that are um, ways to get perfect information without you know, wires and leads, um, and ways that uh, passively monitor uh, us as we use them on a day-to-day -day basis. So this conversational agent actually is being deployed throughout the Kaiser Permanente system. It allows uh, a human to engage into, in essence, an electronic uh, avatar, uh, run through a series of questions, do a series of tests, monitor everything on a, 
uh, data set and then allows the outliers to be uh, brought to the attention of the clinical environment. So in our environment, uh, that means that when somebody's on Mars, they'll be able to catalog what's good and bad about their day-to-day -day life. And then whenever there's anything that's concerning, that will actually get transmitted back to the flight surgeons and they can proactively work a problem before it becomes a problem. And you can see how that would benefit not just care in remote environments um, in, in third worlds, uh, but also possibly care in your home. Meaning we expect the future of healthcare to transition from ambulatory environments directly to our houses. And, and for us to be able to diagnose and treat ourselves with some amount of care from a, a local environment. And so we're trying to drive that process forward a little bit. Um, so this is just kind of a little bit of the field of play um, of, of what we work on. Um, and, and again, it's, you know, it's trying to drive uh, health, uh, the future of health in, into what we think it'll be in 10 or 20 years. So here are some of the risks. You, know, you mentioned radiation, and, and thanks for that, because that is, that is kind of the major thing that's really, really blocking humanity from uh, involving the world, uh, involving the rest of the, you know, space and, and the world beyond uh, our atmosphere. Um, but isolation is one of those key factors, uh, mental health, behavioral health, cognitive performance, how our brain involves uh, being outside of our normal environment. And you can think about it like um, on, a, on these missions, it, it, you're nowhere near comfortable. So you're not going to get a full night's sleep. Uh, the food's not going to taste the same because you can't smell as well as you can in space. Um, and so uh, you're not going to be able to see your friends and family um, on a regular schedule. Uh, anyone in space is, is basically an army of one. There may be another group of crew there, but everybody's pretty autonomous. Um, and so isolation completely removed from humanity, the species, friends, and family, the next you know, uh, sports event, the next TV show, um, all of that stuff is distant. Um, and so isolation will result in anxiety. Um, you, you, we saw a lot of this in the pandemic with people being forced to be at home uh, being isolated from human contact for extended periods of time and the mental effect of that. Um, that's something that uh, NASA has long considered a major concern. Uh, gravity fields. So the difference between um, 1G, which is Earth, and lunar gravity and Mars gravity is just slightly different, but enough to have an impact. Um, so part of that gravity fields would involve a fluid shift. So normally most of your fluids are actually reside in your feet. Um, and then when you get to space, that actually redistributes. Um, so that's why you see the astronauts have these puffy faces. Um, and that's, you know, because they now have more fluids, but up into their actual cranium, which results in a couple of effects. So possibly more pressure on the brain, intracranial pressure, possibly more pressure on the actual nerve from the eye to the brain, and then possibly more pressure on the actual eye itself. And there is a, uh, an actual, uh, possible, uh, malady called SANS, which is space-associated neuroocular syndrome, uh, which could result in uh, in blindness with expended exposure. So, uh, on a on a Mars mission, we want to make sure that our astronauts can see and operate when they get to uh, Mars. And so, a lot of effort is being focused on either how we can combat the fluid shift or how we can actually compensate in the brain and the eyes uh, as as far as countermeasures go. Um, and so gravity fields or, or changes in gravity is important. Also is sensory motor changes, meaning, um, you know, when, when you see astronauts land, they're, they're often debilitated because they've been in zero gravity and then they come back on earth gravity and, 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 and oftentimes they can't walk. And it's actually fascinating to talk to the astronaut crew because the core, uh, because some of the folks that have done several trips will tell you that there isn't an indicator of, of who's going to adapt well and who's not. You know, some of the strongest astronauts in just top physical shape still get debilitated and some of the people you wouldn't expect are just champs. Um, and, and so um, we're trying to unravel what are the uh, ways to understand who will be affected by a complete lack of gravity uh, for some kind of period of time, just so that we can do a pre-screen. If you want to pay a large amount of money to go to the moon, um, then it would be useful to know if you're going to have uh, some debilitating effect when you get to the moon and then also when you come back so that we can potentially plan for and manage that effect. Um, hostile and closed environments. Uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to the pandemic. You know, we, we've all been locked up with our cats and our family. Um, some folks have, have really loved being spending you know, uh, months and months with the same people. Um, but uh, if you could take your house and basically commit to living in a room for two and a half years, uh, you'll see that the, the general space that the astronauts will have 
will be very, very constrained. So um, the expectation on the Mars vehicle, I think, is the equivalent of something like four shipping containers uh, all put next to each other. Uh, and so the, the the space is just not very big. And it, and it again, it's you know three dimensional. So you're going to be floating in different ways. But the actual personal crew quarter where somebody sleeps is very small. Um, and, and so privacy is just not an expectation uh, because every square inch of space costs so much money to get up into space um, that it is a luxury to assume that there will be room to spread out. Um, and so on a Mars mission, everything's going to be packed tight and, and it's going to be very small. And that's why the amount of... Um, uh, personal equipment is is not very much, so you're not you can't take rows and rows of books. There's just no way. Um, but also things like the medical capabilities have to fit within a very small space, and that's not great. <laughs> so if you can only take a certain number of tools, those tools need to be able to do a whole variety of things. So we look for platforms instead of individual tools because every single pound has to perform many, many different functions. Uh, An ultrasound uh, needs to not only diagnose, it needs to also possibly uh, fix things like kidney stones. And then it also probably will be used for something like analyzing sample, uh, soil samples on Mars. Um, they just need to all wear multiple hats. Um, and then also distance from earth. So distance from earth is, um, is, is one of those factors mainly for data. So if you have, uh, something like a 10 to 20 minute data delay. And you have something like uh, what's called, I think the magic hour. Uh, when you have a medical issue, you have something like the first hour where you can do the most to, to turn it around and, and fix the problem. Uh, if you have a 20 minute delay to Mars, then you're going to have to ask a question and get an answer. So you've already eaten up 40 minutes of your magic hour and you only have something like 20 minutes to then respond to what may be an emerging situation. Um, and you just hope it doesn't get worse in that 40 minutes. And when you do get your answer, it's not like you can ask for a clarification immediately. You'll have another 40 minute turnaround time before you can ask your next question. And then that's why things like Agenta are helpful because they're able to take data packets and send them passively. Um, and then also update flight surgeons proactively uh, in order to try to take some of that time delay and make it useful. So if you have a 20 minute period, then what the, uh, what the conversational agent is gonna be doing during that 20 minutes is actually accessing all of the knowledge base on what's needed for that particular situation to try to give you information that would be the low hanging fruit from a flight surgeon. Um, these are the things that you can do immediately to help. These are the considerations. And then the flight surgeon will jump back in and say, in your specific instance, this is how we tailor uh, the feedback. But the distance from earth is one of those factors that uh, leads not just to anxiety, but also to, uh, to actual management issues. And that's why all of the crews have to be autonomous. They have to have their own leadership structures. They have to be able to operate without any help whatsoever, especially on the Mars mission where it, there won't be resupply. We won't be able to send more food or more um, pharmacy materials. We can precede, so we can send things and have them sit there for some amount of time. You can precede for something like three years. Um, and we will, because we'll have something like a hundred tons worth of equipment that will have to go to Mars and we'll only be able to take something like 30 tons on the flight. Um, but that means that everything you send has to still work when, when you need it, uh, which means that the, if you send food, that food has to have a shelf life of something like five years. Um, and, and right now, as you can tell, you know, food has nowhere near that shelf life here on earth. Uh, the contaminants will be different. So it's likely that things will be able to reside for longer periods of time without, you know, this abundance of, of flora that, that, you know, causes things to decay. Um, but that shelf life is a major consideration with regards to, you know, what equipment and what uh, food and pharmacy and, and anything that we send beforehand that will, uh, that they can't go on the flight itself. Um, and then of course, radiation, which is the major thing, the major hurdle that's keeping humanity from uh, leaving earth orbit. Um, the galactic cosmic rays are the thing that causes the majority of injury uh, and likely the, some of the effects um, on, uh, on things like the immune system. And so the radiation is the part that uh, we've spent a ton of time and effort on. We'll continue to spend a ton of time and effort on. And you'll see those types of um, effects result in, in things that will benefit humanity. So with radiation, 
you know, you obviously would think cancer patients, but not necessarily on a specific cancer. What we're looking at is, you know, how do you keep all of the cells around uh, a treatment very focused and healthy? Meaning, you know, you want to very selectively kill one particular malignant tumor, but you want to keep all of the other tissues around it healthy and responsive. And also, is there a way to re re repair some of the damage that galactic cosmic rays do and that cancer may do? So can we actually do genetic repair? Can we do uh, cellular repair and resiliency or even cellular protectants uh, that might result in longevity, You know, a longer period of time on earth for each of our humans because we've actually been able to solve some of the small issues that or injuries that may happen because of um, you know, everyday living in, in, in just, uh, earth environments, uh, either, you know, some of the, the toxins or, uh, or some of the injuries we, you know, we, we in, inflict on ourselves. Um, so we're hoping that, and, and are working towards radiation protectants and radiation countermeasures, um, that we hope will help humanity, you know, on earth as well. Um, some of the other things that, you know, you can see as part of the applications for health on earth that would apply towards space, uh, involved, you know, new medical models. How do we provide care in remote environments? How do we minimize the need for, uh, you know, a, a very expensive or very knowledgeable physician um, and, and do some amount of automation um, so that, you know, some of the simple stuff like, uh, you know, drink uh, or, or, you know, eat soup uh, is one of the things we already do now for, for very easy stuff. And then what are some of the simple things that can be done uh, with minimal medical knowledge, uh, training that will allow, anyone to basically take care of themselves. Um, on the hostile environments, uh, you, you're starting to see things like food recycling here on earth being important. You're also starting to th see things like a carbon economy matter. Um, and, and in this environment, you know, every, car uh, every carbon molecule is, is some part of research and whether it's you know, impactful or not. Um, and in a very closed environment, you can obviously imagine that there is a lot of exhalation and there's a lot of inhalation. Um, and there are things like the oxygen outputs of the plants that will take along to generate some of the food um, and then some of the waste produced. And so there already are CO2 scrubbers, but there is um, a challenge associated with uh, accounting for, you know, every single part of, of the trip, including, you know, every you know, ounce of air and every ounce of carbon dioxide and nitrogen. Um, and all of that um, is a challenge that we think will also help Earth if, if some of the things that we can work on will work in that small space, it hopefully can work on large spaces. Um, on gravity fields, we're looking at things like the circulatory system and, and things like you know, bone repair. Uh, right now, the astronauts have to spend a fair amount of time, something like two to three hours every day doing uh, exertion in order to make sure their bones don't degrade. Um, so the question is, you know, can we do something that doesn't involve that sheer amount of effort? Um, and then, you know, how does that possibly affect um, either some of the performance activities on Earth, things like special forces uh, or, or things like athletes um, or, or just things like, you know, us wanting to go out and, and test ourselves on a, you know, a week weekend or something to that effect. Um, so we're going to be focusing a lot more on, on things like the scaffolding and, and, uh, and the circulatory system um, to make sure that those work well and, and can possibly not just manage decrements, but also possibly uh, even uh, create some kind of augmented or superhuman uh, uh, effect. And then of course, mental health. Mental health is one of the major issues um, um, you know, that affects every group on, on, the, on the world. Um, and you know, mental health, meaning that we want everyone to not just stay in peak performance, but also again, be either managing decrements uh, or, or things like dementia, but also um, augmentation. So how do we actually attach things like the ability to download memory? You know, how can, uh, in the matrix, you saw uh, Neo uh, learn a number of things quickly. Well, is there a way to, um, to augment the brain's activity in an interface so that you're storing some amount of information out of the brain and can access it later? Um, or can potentially even augment skills. And you'll see that same argument in brain computer interfaces for things like prosthetics. Um, how do we have uh, smart arms and legs uh, or, or even you know, go beyond that and look into you know, things that replace arms and legs um, and, and, but are still driven by you know, the, the human uh, that is uh, driving that conversation. Um, so you know, these are just some of the aspects of how you know, we tie not just the needs of space into human uh, need, but, uh, but try to drive forward some of these arguments um, for the benefit of all of mankind. Wow. So I, I, have, I have a long list of questions, but I know you need to, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we are almost an hour here uh, and it's mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, speaking about mental health, you know, 
I stayed with my wife and five kids at a four stories house with a great garden. And we mm -hmm. almost killed each other. I don't know how many times. <laughs> and you're talking with me about people that are going to be stuck in, in, in a small area for so long, eating food that I have a feeling is not the best taste they're yep. going to be eating. And they will not, you know, you said uh, the nose and all, the, you know, they will not be really tasting too much. Did you, so far, I mean, this is, this is like extreme, right? We're talking about two and a half years of that. Uh, 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 but up till now, you heard from astronauts after the trips of mental health issues where they were about to lose it or lost it? So long duration, you'll see a, a cumulative effect on, on things like anxiety. So uh, if somebody's going to spend six months, eight months, a year, something like that, then um, there's some amount of adaptation, but there's also some amount of, 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 of a human response, meaning you know somebody that that doesn't really show anxiety might start showing more and more anxiety. Um, and so these are all considerations for the Mars mission because you're talking about a two and a half year mission. So small things become big things over long periods of time. But on the commercial end, a lot of this is, is, is not identified. So you know, on three day, seven day, 10 day missions, you're not gonna see a whole lot of this. You know, you're, you're not gonna see radiation impacts. You're not gonna see, you might see some amount of anxiety. We might see somebody have uh, some kind of panic attack at launch that that's, that's, that's probably happened. Um, but you know, we haven't, we haven't seen it yet. And, and the difference is that astronauts have a whole lot of training. They have simulations, they, they build their entire career about going up and on commercial side, uh, somebody that can actually pay for it will have something like a six month, um, planning and preparation period where they'll, you know, they'll do a certain amount of physical therapy and they'll do a certain amount of simulation, but it just won't be the same thing as a professional astronaut uh, simply because, you know, one is their job and one is um, not their job. Um, so yes, we have, we've seen some amount of outliers. Um, and, and so whenever you see somebody that, you know, isn't in perfect condition, that's a, that's a learning point. And that's actually what's really exciting about this, the commercial space flight aspect is we're going to get a, people with a wide variety of ages, ages, a wide variety of underlying conditions, a wide variety of things that are just weird. Um, and then those weird things will give us new data points, which is how humanity learns. Um, and that's that's where we're actually hoping to get is to see some of the unusual things that aren't just small headaches, but also, OK, that's something interesting. And that teaches us something about humanity. Um, and that and that's hopefully the the output of something like commercial space flight. Uh, but I, I would. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I'm saying we got three minutes really to finish the hour. So maybe just two quick questions. One is asking something I think you referred to already. Do you think a 2033 flight to Mars is feasible? I think you said yes. yes. And my question to you is how can someone participate in future flights with you guys? Sure. So I can speed. I actually can go over a little over an hour if that's okay. Um, sure. And, and but I so I can um, speed up just a little bit here, but I, I will answer that last question. Um I just wanted to highlight there are there are a, a, I think one of the big differences is the economies right now is there are a number of carriers. So if you have an itch to go to space, you can reach out to SpaceX, Axiom Space, Space Adventures, uh, a whole host of different carriers, and they're all heading in the same direction. And and what we're doing is tying into those uh, for individual missions. Um, so I'll just quickly highlight that uh, the reason that we're looking at commercial space flight as a way to augment the knowledge base for astronauts is that there's going to be a large increase in the next period of time. So you notice that there's something like 550 astronauts across all of nations since the 60s that have uh, flown in space. And it depends on the definition you choose to use, but 550 is not a lot of people. Um, and, and you know most of that at the beginning were military. So it, it's only recently that you're starting to get some kind of diversity of, of, of participants. Um, the reason we're looking at uh, commercial space flight is because we're expecting in the next 20 years this to completely flip. We're expecting 80% of the people that actually go to space to be paying customers, not nation supported uh, uh, employees. Um, so you're still going to have your professional astronauts. You're still going to have some activity for things like um, uh, things like uh, communication satellites. You're still going to have, you know, possibly Space Force and some kind of, you know, military activity in space. Um, but we think that uh, a lot of the data is going to come from people willing to participate on commercial flights. Um, and an example of that is this Inspiration4 flight that just launched out of Cape Canaveral and returned. 
Um, and over that period of uh, three days in space, we actually had the crew do a number of experiments and we monitored all of the experiments. So we did cognitive assessment, again, with mental health. So they actually tested themselves to show the difference between launch time, day one, day two, day three, and return so that they could show the effects of lack of sleep and stress and anxiety and, and fluid shifts. And, and then we do that over several flights. And so we'll get a larger base of knowledge on that. Uh, ultrasound scanning. So we use the, the butterfly IQ to get a number of different uh, looks into things like circulatory and, 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 and then the trunk. Um, and then also real-time blood analysis. So we actually were testing more the system than the humans in that environment because the blood is probably going to be about the same. The question is, is can we do this type of functionality for future and longer duration flights? And then sensory motor testing, which I mentioned is, you know, how debilitating is time and zero gravity? How do you test before and after and during to show uh, some kind of uh, deterioration or impairment uh, or, or lack of impairment? Um, and, and then that's how um, the crew was actually dealing with physical therapists. Um, and so they were engaging uh, to some extent on, on recovery. Um, and so this is just an example of the crew themselves. And, and as they were working on our experiments, uh, again, um, uh, Jared Isaacman, the guy on the right here wearing the watch, uh, paid $100 million and bought the seats for the other three passengers. And all four people uh, spent uh, time doing the research and were committed to doing uh, something for the good of humanity. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, part of this is the cost associated with this first flight. It's going to go up. So the next flight, I believe, next summer is, I think, $160 million. Um, and and there's going to be a lot more research being done on future flights. And the FAA has actually said that in order for you to get your wings, you can't in wings in space. Um, you need to do more than just go. Now you need to actually do something while you're there that benefits humanity. Um, and so we can provide all of the research and health monitoring that makes that time not only very similar to what the astronauts do. So there's an authenticity aspect of that that gives you a real feel of, of representing humanity in space, um, but also the ability to actually um, make that time useful and, and add to your experience so that you learn about yourself while you're in space and take that knowledge home with you. Um, one of the fun things we're doing is actually taking some of this data and, and putting it into an artist and having that artist do a series of, of, um, of art pieces from the data from the flight and then putting those into NFTs uh, or, or cryptocurrency non-fungible tokens. Um, and so what you'll be able to see here in the next couple of months is some of the data from this flight is turning into beautiful art and people will be able to buy that art and, and that will in essence help support some of the future flights and, and future research as well. So this is our team, or at least part of our team that was supporting the actual launch. And so you can see the, the rocket in the background um, down at Cape Canaveral and, and uh, the SpaceX launch uh, pad was actually right over uh, the shoulder of the camera uh, operator. Um, and so if anyone is interested in space or space health or space research, uh, there's a number of ways that they might be able to tie in. So we'll be doing upcoming solicitations. Uh, we'll be launching a solicitation here in uh, the spring that's going to be focused on longevity. So any money that is, uh, it's open to anyone and it'll be a $1 million award uh, for two years worth of work for non-dilutive federal funding, a grant. Um, and, and those awards will be focused on uh, how we address cellular um, repair and, and, and possibly increase uh, not just cognitive performance, but, but actually performance of the body itself. Um, and so those will be available to academics and companies, um, and it will be um, open for a significant period of time. It is highly competitive, um, and then we'll be able to publish the, the results of, the, of that solicitation so that folks can see who is leading in the longevity area. Um, also, we'll be doing another solicitation that's focused on uh, extended reality or augmented reality. So how can we provide medical care in a remote environment with some kind of tie in to a medical expert? Um, and we'll be announcing this actually, I believe, at CES. So if anyone's interested in CES, uh, which is in Las Vegas, there's a large section of CES that's going to be focused on space. It's going to include Sierra Nevada, SpaceX, a number of different carriers. Uh, and those carriers will all be explaining what they can do to get you to space. And then also uh, a lot of the surrounding economy that's evolving. So things like, um, you know, who's, who's doing payloads, who's providing some of the small pieces of technology that all uh, get incorporated into the flights. Um, and then, uh, and, you know, we'll be leading the charge on things like research and, and health. Um, so keep an eye on, on funding. If, any, if anybody knows of anybody that has something that's truly unusual or, or a leap forward, 
we like to say that any anything that involves anxiety, if it makes you feel a little squeamish because it may be going uh, a little outside of the norm, then that's the type of stuff we really want to hear about. That's what we really look for. We want things that make you feel a little bit uneasy, uh, especially on things that you know take leaps forward in health. Um, commercial space flight, we have uh, a number of flights coming up. Um, well, you know, not just the space adventure flight here in December and the Axiom flight in February, um, but also another SpaceX flight in the summertime. Um, and we're, we're actually building towards an all research flight that will launch probably sometime in the next two years. Um, and to do that, we'll have to raise something like $160 million. So uh, the, the federal government can take portions of this. It can take the researchers, it can take the database, uh, but we can't take the ticket price. And while NASA can and probably will take a portion of this in order to advance our knowledge of things like uh, intracranial pressure, um, we will probably be doing a fair amount of fundraising for uh, support of a flight that ambitious. Um, and then, of course, one of the benefits is that if we buy four tickets, We'll need to get four people that will actually submit themselves to being researchers uh, on the flight and, and allow themselves to be tested. Uh, and at least one of those will be a physician, a very decorated astronaut that will possibly even be monitoring himself as well as the other passengers. A lot more to come there, but if there is technology that could be a leap forward and help this environment, we can help validate some of that technology on some of these upcoming flights. Um, so if anybody has either a tie-in to new technologies that, that they think would like to come to market, a, a new company or a new researcher, we can see if it has um, some kind of tie-in to space and see how it would fit. And if it does advance NASA, then we can fund it and we can fly it. Um, so those are things to consider as well. And then also we're going to be pulling together a Space Health Pioneer Roundtable, which is uh, individuals that can help us do some amount of fundraising for some of these flights. Again, NASA uh, already covers a good amount of this and is committed to what we're doing. Um, but it, it's one of those unusual situations where as I, you know, as we do more business development, as we line up more flights, each flight ends up costing something like three to $500,000 or more, depending on duration and, and complexity of the crew. Um, so each time we successfully line up another flight, we now add more and more expense. And while I can cover a good portion of that to begin with in year two, year three, year four, it's going to start being more than the budget will accommodate. And so we're looking for either folks that will help support flights or support technology on flights um, or possibly participate in helping to organize how we would do fundraising across interested parties. So, uh, you know, part of that will be involving the, the crews in some of these uh, interested people. Uh, some of these will be uh, some of the streaming launches. So people will be able to watch some of the launches or even go to some of the launches, participate in the crew before and after, um, or potentially look at, at flying themselves. So there may be some somebody that's on this call that is interested in, in one of the you know upcoming flights. And I think space Axiom Space has something like the next four flights already booked. Uh, each of those flights are to the ISS and each of those involve four crew members. So you've got something like 16 people that are lined up each paying $50 million uh, in order to go for a week or a week and a half on the International Space Station. Um, so there's a number of carriers there and, and we have access to all of them. And so um, if anyone wants to fly or wants to support flight, there's you know plenty of ways that we can try to help. Um, so these are some of the different ideas, but being an innovation institute, we are actually built to try to be um, flexible. And, and so if somebody sees something we don't, we love that. We love it when somebody has an idea that we've never accounted for. Um, and if there's a way that we can either build a new model or a new solicitation or, uh, or, or some other approach to upcoming flights, uh, we love to hear it and, and love to try to tackle some of those ideas. Great. Thank you so much. It's been uh, really uh, fascinating. I saw a lot of questions here about can uh, we get the deck? Uh, can we get in touch and all of that? Um, so, um, I just want to say that this is being recorded, um, and you will send me the contact info that we will be sending everybody here and everybody who registered and could join us. Um, I obviously have loads of questions, which, which will not happen today. No, no I'm, so. I, I can, I can wait, I can, I can try to take what I can. Um, so if, if you or anyone else has questions, then I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to answer the best as I can. Sure. I think I, I, I I would love, you know, to do another session, maybe, and dive more into details because there's really a lot. I think we can we can still discuss. Um, I want to mention that uh, um, in uh, and we and by the way, we had Anusha Anzari, which I, I I'm sure uh, you've yep. heard of, and that was also a fascinating discussion. Um, 
I, I want to remind everybody that uh, uh, February 1st in Dallas and February 3rd in Houston, uh, we're um, coming back with our conferences there and uh, hopefully we'll see you and an entire panel about this subject uh, that we'll be discussing there. Yeah, absolutely. So in Houston, again, that's our neighborhood. So I can bring, you know, not just members of the Trish team or possibly even, uh, you know, some of the funded investigators that we've got, but also possibly some of the NASA uh, leadership. So I may be able to bring somebody from um, the human research program here at Johnson Space Center. Um, and in Dallas, uh, it's really interesting. Mass Challenge, which does a ton of innovation activity across the country in health and many other uh, aspects, is pulling together activities in uh, Fort Worth and Dallas. And so they're going to be actually doing a, a kind of a space hub out of, I believe, either Fort Worth or Dallas. Uh, and it will be launching, I believe, in January or February. So that'll be about the same time as the Dallas meeting. And so what I'll try to do is see if I can tie in some of the mass challenge people in that emerging ecosystem so they could explain if you live in Dallas and you really care about this, you could get involved from an aspect of what uh, of the folks that live up in North Texas. Um, so, yes, we'll, we'll work on you know, a way that we can have an interactive discussion uh, for anyone that's interested. I do have the, our contact information here. So if you just put somehow in the email, please, James, see this, um, then then the group that handles these will route, you know, all of the questions to me and I'll, I'll follow up, of course. Um, we, uh, to, you know, I, I welcome all discussion. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll try to answer what I can here in short order. Yeah, I think um, uh, you actually spoke about lots of what uh, I had here for you, um, and uh, I would I'm looking forward to do a, a future discussion probably before you go to Mars, um, <laughs> <laughs> which means early next year, uh, online as well. And yeah, and I'm uh, I'm 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 very happy that you were here with us today, and and thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Um, I actually have a, found, a family foundation as well that's focused on health and women. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, women and children, health and education. And so um, out of that uh, family foundation, which is not a family office, but the foundation gives a small amount around something like 100,000 a year. But we are playing around with program related invest in, investments and mission related investments. Um, and, and the NFT project I've just described is actually a mission related investment from the foundation. Um, so if there is anybody that's interested in exploring that territory with regards to you know, how you make your capital, uh, either the, you know, the amount that you have to give away every year for the IRS to remain compliant, um, or also possibly something outside of that into an endowment. Um, you know, we've, we've actually put a, a fair amount of time, effort, and, and legal uh, expertise into that. Uh, if anybody's actively doing that, then there's a number of things that we can explain uh, that might be of interest, not just in our funded community, so the technologies like Agenta that are coming to market, um, but also in some of our upcoming flights, uh, such as the Art Project or some of the others. Um, and and it's, it's kind of an exciting time, frankly. Uh, five years ago, uh, parts of the Institute were looking at this exact same area, and uh, and, there, and there just wasn't anything there. So Virgin Galactic was still very early. SpaceX was still very early. But now you've, you've actually got a ton of activity. And so you've got groups like JP Morgan that are doing uh, breakdowns of the space economy and how it's going to grow. You've got things like mining that may be coming online. Um, and so it is a, a new frontier. And one of the real questions we get is, you know, why should we spend time and effort on space when we have real prob pro problems on Earth? Um, and our response is that it, it's a unifying factor. So it, it's a way for us to look out beyond us instead of war against each other. You know, how do we not have disagreements because of different philosophies or different religions or different backgrounds, but instead look at common goals for all of us to overcome things like longevity, things like um, uh, you know, surviving and thriving in space and how do we help things like food production on earth. Um, and so we, we think space is not just a fun frontier for things like science fiction, but it's also a way for us to be better. Um, and so, you know, in that environment, we, we look for creativity. So if anybody has any uh, interest in, in exploring that, we're here to help. Thanks. Thank you so much. We've been, uh, we've known each other for several years now, uh, mm -hmm. since we met uh, before we did our first conference in Houston, I believe like four years ago. So it's a really pleasure. And, and, and I'm seeing your mm -hmm. excitement and the developments on your end. And mm -hmm. we will continue to this, this discussion in person in Texas and online again next year. And again, all of you will receive uh, 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 the contact information and, uh, and we'll be able to watch the recorded session. So 
James, thank you so much and uh, keep on doing this great, amazing work. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, look forward to also, again, being in person. Thank you, guys. Thank you, James. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Take care. Yeah.